Hey, Jim Hoffman here for EMS Office Hours. Uh, this is your Monday Minutes, and as I mentioned in the last episode, I'm going to try to start kind of cranking out these quick um, EMS quick study uh, videos that focus on some key elements when it comes to taking your exam and preparing for your EMS exam. So these are the types of things that you might say, hey, what's going to be on the exam, right? So I'm not going to go into really great detail into all these bullet points because these videos could last for hours, right? In a regular, regular classroom, these types of content would be an hour-long presentation, right? But what I'm trying to do is give you the key elements, the things that you can focus on that are going to usually be seen on primary EMS exams, right? State exams, national exams, things like that. So let's get into this. And this week, again, we're talking about medical legal aspects. This is part one. Next week, I'll have part two up. So let's get right into this. And we're talking about things like prevention, right? So we talk about preventing legal problems, right? We want to prevent the legal issues before they even start. So things that you need to do is, is things like giving proper care within the school of practice that you're in, whether you're an EMT, a paramedic, maybe an EMTI, okay? You want to follow your local protocols, your state protocols, and what you're allowed to do through your medical control, right? And finally, you want to make sure you do proper and thorough and accurate documentation, okay? Oftentimes you hear that a lot, right? All your documentation is key to preventing and protecting yourself from legal issues. Now, negligence. Now, some of the things you want to try to do in order to reduce negligence claims is provide continued education for yourself. Uh, again, do your appropriate medical directions, document everything like I just mentioned, and believe it or not, maintaining a professional attitude and demeanor can actually help reduce negligence negligence claims because you're going to presenting yourself as a professional okay and not sort of triggering anybody to think that you're not doing the right thing okay believe it or not your attitude and your demeanor will go a long way when we talk about preventing negligence claims now what are some of your legal duties or your ethical responsibilities okay as an EMT or a paramedic well some of the things that are of course you want to maintain the skills that you're supposed to be uh, responsible for right intubation is the big one for paramedics right you want to be able to maintain that uh, type of a skill your IV access skills blood pressure even is a, is a common skill basic skill but you need to maintain that type of thing you want to respond to needs of patients that you come in contact then within your scope of practice and we're going to talk a little bit about that later on but you want to respond to them within the scope of practice, what you're allowed to do, uh, you know, under your, um, your, your certification or your license. And again, report, uh, honestly, respectfully and, and, and maintain that patient's confidentiality, right? Very important type of stuff. You don't want to be, uh, 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 fudging things or, uh, you know, giving away your patient's privacy, right? Of course, we all talk about HIPAA, a big thing, right? So, that's one of the things you can do to help, uh, you know, your legal issues and, your, and what your ethical responsibilities are. And finally, guys, work cooperatively and with respect, okay? And this is sort of, again, to me, that sentence alone could be a whole presentation within itself, right? But if you look at these bullet points, these are the things you might see on an exam. But we talk about working cooperatively and with respect. We're talking about when we're talking to our patients when we're doing things with other healthcare providers, when we're working with family members and other uh, professionals, when we're providing our patient care. Now, some of the types of law that you should think about and that apply to EMTs and paramedics at any level, right? These are the, again, guys, bullet points you're going to see on, on an exam, right? So what are the types of law that we often apply to us as EMS providers? Well, legislative is one, administrative, common law, civil law, and of course, criminal law. So what is your best protection? Well, to me, and I think what you're going to find in a lot of exams and what you're going to see when you're... Uh, in a question sort of uh, environment, an answer sort of environment, is that 
the the best legal protection guys is appropriate assessment and care and you're going to couple that with accurate and complete documentation now again we've mentioned scope of practice before so what is scope of practice when we talk about scope of practice what you probably are going to see when you see an answer on an exam an answer choice is going to be something like you're looking at right here so i actually put this almost verbatim so that you can see what you probably would see when it comes to looking at uh, an exam, when you get some a question that might say, what is scope of practice or what what defines scope of practice? And like it says here, it is the range of duties and skills an EMS worker is allowed or expected to perform defined by the Medical Practice Act. Now, if you're not sure what the Medical Practice Act is, I don't, again, don't get too much into it here, but go check out your textbook. Okay, it's right in your textbook what exactly that is. Uh, should you need more uh, definition but I think for the purposes of an exam they usually won't ask you what that is uh, although they might say what is the medical practice act and you'll see something in there about how it defines the scope of practice right so keep that in mind when you're studying for your an exam you're, you're, you're kind of uh, refreshing for an exam uh, these key terms here guys because that's going to help you get that answer correct now here I title this ordinary negligence, right? Because you might say, what the heck is ordinary negligence versus regular negligence? Now, negligence for us in the field, all right, usually is um, something that's going to also be kind of hand in hand with malpractice. So we see malpractice and negligence, they kind of go hand in hand, all right? So you have regular negligence, which is that kind of that goes below a standard of care. Then ordinary negligence, which is acts of omission that occur in your attempt to deliver proper care and then gross negligence this is the stuff that you're doing that you're, you're you're consciously doing it you're reckless and you're giving care that results in injury to your patient now in order to prove negligence you've got those four requirements right you I'm sure you've heard this before now again guys I'm not this is not meant to give you a medical legal uh, presentation per se it's actually meant to give you the bullet points so that you can take an exam and remember these key elements, okay? So you, this is something you're going to see a lot, right? Those four, what, what's required to prove negligence or what four requirements are needed to prove negligence? And here they are. Your duty to act, your breach of duty, um, injury, and cause. We talk about cause. We talk about, about proximate cause, which is... Uh, what the actions that you might have done, you might have done something that you might have done that immediately caused that problem. Okay, so you know a patient that may, if you get a patient, you get into an accident with, with your ambulance, the patient might be injured, and then they can say that this is from your wrongdoing, right? But a patient that maybe has a heart attack in the back of the ambulance can't really say that you caused it because you were there in the back of the ambulance. Okay, so keep that in mind. That proximate cause. So anyway, these four. Uh, things are those key four requirements that are required to prove the negligence okay now some things you also might see also um, and when we talk about uh, uh, this sort of type of thing is malfeasance uh, misfeasance or nonfeasance and and again these are the type of um, uh, terms you're going to probably see on exams so it's important to sort of memorize and remember these key elements, okay, between malfeasance, misfeasance, and nonfeasance, okay? So, you know, the malfeasance being the wrong or unlawful act, the misfeasance being a legal act that, that was performed in a harmful way, or the nonfeasance, which is a, a failure to perform that required act or that, that duty. And we go back to things like breach of duty and your duty to act and things like that. These kind of go hand in hand with those four elements okay and guys listen you hear this a lot good samaritan laws right they don't really apply to us in ems when you're in uniform and you're acting on the ambulance you are working you're under a contract right you've got that duty to act it doesn't really apply for us in ems maybe your state your region might have a good samaritan law when you're off duty but when it comes to when we're working on the ambulance and we can be sued for negligence or 
um, you know, or, or prove that we had we had a duty to act, or that we caused an injury, or that we we had a breach of duty. The Good Samaritan Law is not going to help us in those cases. What's going to help us is, like we mentioned early on, that documentation and and you know the proper care and proper assessment of our patients. So, guys, again, this uh, short video, actually a little bit longer than what I wanted it to be. Uh, because again, I'm trying to focus these videos on key elements of your EMS education, but also on, in a way to try to show you the key terms, items, and subjects that you're going to often see on your EMS exams. So when hopefully when you see these questions that ask you specifically what are the four requirements to prove uh, negligence, right? Uh, what is... Uh, a scope of practice, um, you know, what's the best defense against, uh, you know, uh, legal issues or what are the ethical responsibilities, all those types of things, right? Again, crammed into this short video, but what I'm trying to do is give you those bullet points, give you those key elements to help you pass your exam, okay? There, we can go into the, the, the hour-long presentation on this. I actually have those over at TurboMedic at TurboMedic.com where I have the, the I've I've started putting up those hour long, thirty minute long, forty five minute long, even longer uh, presentations that go deep into this content, right? But for the purposes of the Monday minutes, of course, as you know, is to keep it short, keep it sweet, and to be able to give you things that you can use right away, either in the field or on an upcoming exam. So I hope these really help. Now, if you like this type of content that kind of focuses on just uh, the meat and potatoes, right? I've got this great quick study guide over on the website where it focuses on just this, okay? And a lot of the content here actually is pulled from this guide, all right? And it kind of goes into just the things you need, the, the overview of the terms and the subjects that you're going to see on an exam, all right? And it might be the things that you kind of don't remember. You don't remember what systolic blood pressure is, or you don't remember... Um, you know, what four quadrants of the abdomen are and what's in each quadrant, right? So this quick study guide really drills down, takes that 500-page, 600-page textbook and compresses it into about 110 pages um, of all these key elements that I talked about. So it's good. It's not the thing I would use to study 100% for an exam, but it is the thing I would use to go over and remind yourself of key elements uh, so that you say to yourself, you know what, I know all about uh, diabetes, let's say, right? You're comfortable with that topic um, when it comes to what diabetes is and what goes on with your patient, the medications you might use or they might use and stuff like that, right? But maybe you want to just kind of breeze over it without having to go into your textbook and read that 20, 30-page chapter on diabetes so you can look at it right here and get the key highlights just to sort of refresh your memory on what it is that uh, diabetics do, right? And that's what this guide is. It's just a quick uh, meat and potatoes of, of, of any of EMS course. So it's great to review before an exam, uh, great to look at for, for terms and subjects. Like I said, you might be having troubles with, trouble with. Go check this out, guys. Uh, you can click the button here, click the click, click here for details link. It'll take you over to the site. You can read all about it and get more details on it. So if you're interested in this type of thing, great content. This is a great little thing to add to your EMS library. I actually have it in a digital format and a physical book as well. All right, guys, that's it for me. I hope you can use these Monday Minutes. I hope you find them useful. This week a little bit longer than what I would have liked, but again, as these, these subjects go on in this series, some of these Monday Minutes might be a little bit longer than others, okay? But I'm going to try to break it down as much as I can so it makes sense to you, the, the viewer, and also helps you when you talk about what we're trying to pull out from these specific Monday Minutes and the EMS Quick Study resources here at uh, EMS Office Hours. So again, guys, you have some minutes of your own that are related to this or anything else, be sure to send them over to me. It's it's uh, contact at emsofficehours.com. And until next week, as always, Jim Hoffman, stay safe. <music>